Thanks everyone for joining us today to a discussion about this year's competition of the Sony World Photography Awards 2022. I'm joined here today by Scott, CEO of the World Photography Organization, Jan, Director of Marketing for Sony Europe, and Mike, the Exhibition Curator and Chair of the Pro Jury. We're also going to be joined today by two of our overall winners, and just a reminder that the information uh, that you'll be hearing about today is under embargo until 12th of April at 6 a.m. BST and 7 a.m. CET. So, starting with you, Scott. Can you talk a bit about the competition this year, how it went, and the general reactions and reception to it? Yeah, this is our 15th year of the Sony World Photography Awards, and you know, each year the contest grows, and I think it gets a, a greater resonance and exposure around the world, which is fantastic, and this year is, is no exception. We had over 340,000 images come through the contest across all the different competitions, and it's fantastic, and it's, it's great to see, and it's great to see such compelling work from every corner of the world from what has been obviously quite an interesting year in, in the world. And what particularly stood out for you this year? We attract a lot of diverse work from different walks of life and it's actually how those stories are told. You know, we, we constantly are trying to sort of push the narrative but also try to look for original perspectives on work and really unique concepts that are coming through and how those stories are told, doing it in unique and different ways. I think it's absolutely are stunning. So I'm really delighted with sort of how the work's come across and, and, and in, in all the winners this year. Where would you position the Sony World Photography Awards? What's different? What's unique about it? Um, obviously, I'd say it's the best. <laughs> um, but uh, I generally think it stands there for the community. It's a competition that's free to enter. We know that if you win a Sony World Photography Award, it changes your career. Mm -hmm. We know our professional recipients have gone on to get publishing deals and we end up representing with our agents for a year, you know, if not more so. And, and we work so hard in pushing these photographers out there through the year, doing the exhibitions and really, really telling their stories. For me, that's the, the success of it, really. And Jan, this is now Sony's 15th year supporting the competition. Why do you keep coming back to it every year? <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question in the sense that if you go back 15 years ago, Sony was almost nothing in photography. We were just starting a Sony World Photography Award as well because it was a brand new competition and we grew together, I think, through the years to become the leader brand in photography and also in videography now, of course, as well. We have been supporting the competition for, for 15 years, so there's no way to stop us anymore. So I think we, we sign again for another uh, five years, up to 2027, and uh, the, the key thing is the platform itself, how uh, we can support photography and give this platform for photographer to grow and be visible. We don't care about the brand. In the end, it's about photography, images, and culture. So that's what motivates us to be part of this big event every year. And Mike, you're curating the exhibition this year, and you also judge the professional panel, the professional competition. Can you tell us a bit about your impression of the works we're going to be seeing? This year, 2022, is surprising. The amount of entries, the quality, bearing in mind the past years of COVID, has been extraordinary. And what's interesting is that there are ever bigger photographers entering. You know, the winners this year are big established photographers, which I don't think they were so much 10, 15 years ago when we started out. So to see household names coming forward, and then for me to get the chance to have them not win, is brilliant. <laughs> um, the jury from around the world, to work with them is a privilege and a responsibility. And for me, the winner always has to have an ethical element. I think photography is a global enterprise explaining the world and to not use that platform to make sure that big stories are told that are emotional and real to people's daily lives would be foolish. So it is about then content and intention and integrity. Respect for the subject is key. So, moving on to this year's professional competition, which rewards a body of work of five to ten images. We're going to start off with Mike and talk about the judging process this year, how you felt that was different to previous years and the kind of work that came out of that process. We have ten categories to go through, and it's always difficult choosing an overall winner from ten diverse categories, you know, from portraiture to portfolio, which is a relatively new section and has actually been quite strong 
to environment, to landscape, to wild, you know, wildlife. So judging for everyone is taking all the things we know about photography, looking at all the stories that come in, and then trying to make a, a value judgment on what is supposed to be the best. You know, on a different day, another one, someone else could win. Environment for me is always passionate because I think it's ever more important. Great stories on plastics, on Bangladesh, the struggles with flooding there. And working through that and understanding it and feeling it is a good story is, is tricky. But the best work does rise to the top. And I believe that and I believe it every year. And I think we always come up with good winners that people understand and feel is strong and valid. I can stop being earnest now. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's just a lot of fun to do. What I love about the, the series-based work is that individually they're very elegant, very nice. Actually, when you then look at it and you start to sort of peel the layers of what you're looking at, you understand that it's about how, in this particular series by Kimura, you know, how people are living with areas that are massively affected by flood and drought and erosion and all those things and actually how they, they live around that. And, and it's take, not just yeah. about the sort of, you know, going back to that point you were saying about it's easy to shock, you know, it'd be very easy for the photographer to go, shock, 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 here's death and destruction. But actually, how Kimura well, has shot that work, yeah. it's, it's made you engage with it more. But bouncing on that, so that I was uh, thinking about uh, um, the winner of the wildlife, the, the fox tail, I think is the yeah. title. The fox is a night creature. It's not the nice little puppet that plays in the snow all the time. Yes. And he captured this picture when the fox is in this particular light that is quite harsh, quite uh, dry, I would say, and the fox is not, doesn't look pretty. And I really like this idea about how he created the picture and the story, yeah. and that he wasn't necessarily but trying to create something pretty. I think that's exactly spot on. We were talking earlier about you know, that difference between the open and the professional, but actually that is the word, right? Yeah. Because open, that single shot is in many ways pleasing, whereas this is about the story yeah. and the, the level of study they have to do to do it. I think it's remarkable yeah. and needs, therefore, to be celebrated and applauded yeah. um, and they really deserve the accolades that they get. Yeah. So leading on from that interesting discussion, uh, it is time to find out who is our big winner this year and I'm going to hand over to Mike to announce. And I'm pleased to announce that the winner of the Sony World Photography Awards 2022 professional competition is Adam Ferguson with his story Migrantes based in Mexico. We're delighted to have Adam join us today from Sydney, Australia. Oh, congratulations, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us from Sydney. Thank you, Inval, for uh, everything. Um, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mike. I'm extremely excited to, to win for this set of pitches and accept this award on behalf of not only myself, but the migrants um, who I photographed and participated in this collaborative work with me. Can you actually start by introducing the project and telling us a little bit about how you came up with the concept and approached it? So early last year in 21, when there was a change of administration in America, there was a rush of migrants on the border who thought their chances of, of getting into the United States was better under President Biden. And I felt like I wanted to participate in that conversation around migration in a, in a different way, in a way that kind of wasn't being done. And I wasn't seeing a lot of work being done on the Mexican side of the border. So I pitched a project to my editor at the New York Times and I traveled to Juarez first and I started visiting migrant shelters with a medium format camera and a tripod and a cable release and interviewing migrants. And through that process, staging a portrait with them collaboratively and then surrendering control of the shutter to the migrant to make a, a self-portrait in collaboration with me. And was that quite different to what you would normally do in your practice? Uh, I'd never worked like this before, but it felt like an interesting thing to do because I was curious to see if I could make a set of pictures which perhaps inspired more empathy than sympathy. And the work that I was seeing inspired a lot of sympathy. I wanted to make a set of images that gave the migrants more agency I think by kind of surrendering that moment of capture and that migrant um, knowing that they're in control and they're looking into the camera technology, perhaps even through it, had a kind of honest value that I, I don't think I've, I've made in other work. And what was the response from your collaborators? How did they react when you first approached them with that request? 
most of the people I met were in one of the, the hardest moments of their life. They traveled a long way, uh, they were hungry. I met people that had been released by cartels that very day that I photographed them. So my, my idea of collaboration really came down to them sitting in front of the camera and squeezing a shutter release. People were struggling and they wanted to tell their story. And if you sit and listen, uh, people open up and there's something cathartic um, for them in that process. And when it came to editing, you then, you made the final choice on what it was seen. Did they have anything, you did, did you have a Polaroid or you were just able to shoot them and then, and then move on? Ultimately, I made the, the editing choices. I, I, I retained a fair amount of authorship in this process. It was about the agency of them participating in the process. I think that's what made it interesting for me and that's what I felt important about handing over a shutter release and, let, and letting them choose a moment of capture. With one of the migrants in particular, Amy Rose, she was a, a trans woman. When she stood in front of the camera, she got very nervous. So I cocked the shutter and I made everyone walk away from the camera, myself included. And I told her through my translator that she could choose the moment that she wanted to represent herself. We would all move away. So we did that. She had the shutter release and we all walked away about 10 meters and looked in the other direction and had a conversation. And in that minute, she made an experience Exposure of herself kind of with her leg against the wall kind of looking up into the air in this quite beautiful gracious posture and and, and that's the kind of thing that happened. As a series they're in, incredibly sensitive as you say they sort of provide this incredible dignity to the individuals which is beautiful. Some of them you were completely absent of the of the scene when they took the picture or did you participate and motivate them or what was your attitude during the shot? Each sitting was slightly different and if they didn't have ideas on how they wanted to present themselves, I tended to just ask them to be in situ. So there's a young girl called Stephanie who I photographed and I saw her sitting at the tent where she was staying with her mother. I got permission of her mother and her mother was present. And then we asked her how she wanted to pose and she, you know, she was, she was young and shy and, you know, in this kind of transitory um, uncertain and very precarious, you know, moment in her life. Um, so she didn't have an idea. Um, so I just asked her to sit where exactly how I saw her when for the very first time. So if I was instructing and directing the pose, I very much anchored that in the way that I had encountered the migrant or that made sense to their story or, or the way they were already posing. I saw some of your images, the remote control is, or uh, wire remote is quite visible and in some of them they are not. Was there any intention to show it or to hide it or what was your idea when you did or you didn't really take any notice of it or any intention was behind? I made the decision to work um, with film, um, with the analog process because I wanted the audience to be able to see the, the shutter release. I think the only ones where you can't see it is where I've come close on one woman and it's mm. a, a very tight portrait of her face. But all the others, you can, you can see it, I'm pretty sure. Were they able to see their image once you've made the choice of which one to use? Did you manage to keep in touch with any of them, find out if they managed to cross? I did keep in touch with a, with a couple of them. Um, uh, Carlos and Anderson, who were the first picture in the series, the father and the son, and they were on the front page of the New York Times. They made it to New York and we united with our, their sister and wife, a journalist and I managed to get in contact with about half of them again. Just more than half of them we, we weren't able to contact again because they had changed cell phones and probably entered America or gone into some form of detention. And can you um, tell us just, in, um, just a little bit about your practice in general and some of other projects that you worked on? in the past? Worked on many different kind of portrait series at this point where the end photograph really comes out of a, uh, a, a conversation and a, a, a staging and perhaps more manipulation than I did in this, this series that won the award. I've worked on a set of portraits in Nigeria where I staged young female suicide bombers where I couldn't conceal their identity. So I like the idea of playing with portraiture and letting a, a, a personality come out. 
And Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the moment when uh, you found out you won the overall Photographer of the Year award? I, w I wasn't expecting a, a series like this that was collaborative um, and perhaps drew on a bit more of an artistic process to be awarded in the, the Sony Award Photography Awards. So, I, you know, I felt, I felt very excited. I felt very honoured. I mainly felt excited because I think winning an award like this uh, gives a story a second life and allows uh, a whole new audience to engage um, with a set of pictures. There's lots of people who take great technical photographs. The fact that you put yourself into that situation in Juarez with real people, that you gave them the power, that they're beautiful, um, it just made it come to the top quite quickly. I mean, we're truly delighted that you're the Photographer of the Year this year, both in terms of as an individual and, and what you do and what you represent, but also the body of work that you shot. And hopefully we can do it justice for you uh, and for um, the migrants themselves and hopefully show the work around through, throughout the year. I really appreciate it and I'm very grateful for the, uh, for the support that, uh, that Sony gives through this award. And um, yeah, thank you very much. So that was great. Let's move on and talk a little bit about this year's open competition. The open competition obviously rewards single images where we have a very diverse set of photographers that enter every year and anyone could win. Which images stood out for you this year, Scott? It is diverse and I think with the open competition being that single shot, we do end up with established professionals entering that sort of single image because they haven't necessarily done a body of work that year or also sort of emerging photographers coming through. So it's, it's difficult to select, you know, what, sort of what one's favorite is. But if I was gonna choose from the open winners this year across the categories, it's pretty diverse. A lot of black and white, I have to say, which, is, uh, which isn't normal, actually. The, normally the open competition is much more colorful. I think six or seven of the, of the, the winners are, are black and white. Personally, I like the Sunflowers by a Spanish photographer, Ansola. I think they're incredible. Actually, I didn't realize they were sunflowers when I first sort of went through them. And they look like these sort of shrouded humans that are in, in the landscape. And they're really, really quite powerful. Yeah, and, it's um, staggering. Photo, yes, yeah, absolutely, really. yeah. But what I did like, I don't know if you noticed, is the, in the image, you really have the feeling that there is a moment, that mm. these women that are flowers, yeah. that are still, are actually walking yeah. and, and moving. And they, yeah, they're they, coming towards yeah, you. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. That, that's really, Really impressive. Yeah. And what would you say is a different approach you see photographers take when they have to tell a story in a single image versus a series of images? From a viewer's perspective, you want to be hit straight away. Whereas for me, from a viewer's perspective, with a body of work, I want to peel the layers. I want to get into that. And I, I, I don't mind that happening slowly. You sort of get more involved in the work. From a photographer's perspective, I assume that you know, doing a whole body of work and editing that together is a is is a, is a very different challenge to that single single shot. Every photographer may have taken a hundred shots from that thing. That's the one shot they felt was the winner. So there may be a narrative there anyway. And with a single shot, it's getting a complete narrative into one image. That's why the public like them so much because they are so punchy and direct. There's a lot going on, and you feel them immediately. There's not a great deal of nuance necessarily in them, and there shouldn't be. Anyone can win it from just having seen something and caught it in that moment with no planning whatsoever. Or well, very often yeah. we just like something that's really beautiful. Yeah. That's right, and it's, it doesn't need to be any more than that. It's yeah. simple. I mean, you know, for me, I really like the surfing picture yeah. in The Hague by um, Radio Nurk. It's an amazing photograph caught in the afternoon dust. The surfs look incredible. It's a thing so few of us can do. I believe you can surf brilliantly well, Scott. I can. But, um, <laughs> you know, I no one's actually can. seen this true. happen, so. I've got but, photos. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that shot for me is a beautiful image of you know, sea and surfers and it's wide and it's, it's stunning. So it just works and that's the whole narrative in one thing. You, you actually said to me maybe, maybe about 10 years ago, it's really easy to shock and it's really difficult to capture beauty. Yeah. I think that's exactly it. It's like that surfer image is, is stunning, right? I mean, it's absolutely, yeah. you know, yeah, I timeless. Think what is challenging is to capture beauty but differently as well. Because if you do the same shot that everyone is doing in the same spot, in the same light, 
it's, it might be a beautiful shot, but it won't be different. And what I think as well is important on this open category, that the photographer has to produce a picture that we haven't seen before. So how we view people are always changing what beauty is. And um, they're entirely to do with you know, your cultural influences and what is going on at a particular time. You know, black and white have become far more beautiful for people. They read it better now than they used to maybe 15 years ago. There is a sense of um, looking at the past as well with black and white, which is why I think it's also become so strong. But it's, it's interesting what you're saying because the picture I liked was uh, from Etienne Souchon in Cuba, and uh, it's in black and white. In it's ha- one of in those. Havana, yes. <laughs> and it's like a, you don't know when it's happening. Timeless. It could, yeah, it could yeah. be in the 1930s, or but it's, it was actually shot quite recently, yeah. I suppose, because you can see uh, one of the uh, person in the shot has a backpack. Uh, so it's obviously a very, uh, very, very modern, modern picture. Yeah. You could imagine any story. You see this mm. kid running around with his bag in his hand, looking away. Mm. Is he stealing something? Is he running away from th- something? We don't know uh, exactly what happens. Uh, and then there is yeah. a story behind the picture. Am- ambivalent. Yeah, what we try to guess, but we don't know what it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. That was very interesting to hear your thoughts and impressions about some of the standout images this year. And to announce the Open Photographer of the Year, I'm going to give it over to Jan. I'm very happy to announce that Sony World Photography Awards Open Competition winner this year is Scott Wilson for the Anger Management Photo. Brilliant, and we're so pleased to have Scott join us today. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, Colorado, USA today and congratulations for winning Open Photographer of the Year. Thanks so much. It's an absolute thrill to be here, join you for this round table. I can't wait to see you all in London, but for for now, it's just great to speak to you from Colorado. Scott, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your winning image, Anger Management? Yeah, sure. Um, Anger Management is a a wild stallion in northwest Colorado. He has just been dipping in a mud pool to try and bake himself against the 100 degree heat that you have in the summer. And now he's moving towards the watering hole and he's pounding the ground and kicking up a dust storm, really just letting other stallions know that he's ready to fight uh, for his place at that water hole. And for me, that fight was symbolic of some of the challenges wild horses are facing in the United States today, um, where they're just under constant threat uh, of roundup and being put into captivity. So to capture this wild moment of of a truly beautiful uh, wild animal in action. It's just a a fantastic uh, feeling for me. And how long have you known about this horse? I mean, what drove you to to go there and how long has it taken you to get to this point of having that kind of image? Good question. So I I might need to take you back a few years. I was a landscape photographer for a couple of decades. Moved to Colorado in 2015. And in 2016, uh, I was struck down, I suppose, by stage four colon cancer. Clearly that just stops your life in many ways. And after I sort of worked out, I had a treatment plan that I could go through. My oncologist explained that I would need to avoid sunlight completely because of the the treatment. So I started to look for options from a photo point of view. It's my therapy, it's it's kind of my, you know, a a way of getting through a, a challenge like this. And I started photographing wildlife through the shade of my car stay in the shade uh, from sunlight. It started to build a, a wildlife portfolio that way. And through that, I was introduced to the wild horses, first through a sanctuary. We basically said, where are these horses originally? Where are they living wild? And they pointed me 300 miles northwest to this corner of Colorado called San Wash Basin, which is 160,000 acres. Just to give you a perspective, that's, that's like New York. Uh, and there were six or seven horses spread across this massive expanse. So, so the notion that you're pinpointing a particular horse is actually very difficult. You know, when, when you find one, you, you take advantage of, of that situation. And I've just been cataloging uh, these horses and their behavior and, and, and their, their kind of wild existence for the last four years. And how close to the horse are you when you shot it? I mean, it's impossible to tell what, what lens distance you've got on that. So I'm using uh, a 600 mil lens, so I'm, you know, I'm at a decent distance. Uh, guidelines is to stay at least 100 feet from these animals. And I'm always using as long a lens as, as reasonable. Sometimes I've even got a teleconverter on to take it up to 
850, um, just to preserve the behaviour. You don't really want to interfere with these horses. And of course, they're wild. If they start fighting, you do not want to be in the way of a wild horse. I don't think it would deliberately knock you down. But when they see red and they're fighting, uh, you get in the way of that and, and you, you probably wouldn't survive. So as I say, I'm probably about 100 feet and I'm slightly elevated looking downhill, which I think just adds to the dynamic of this particular shot. I mean, usually I pride myself in getting eye level with wildlife and just this slightly elevated view is just giving it a, a, a different dynamic tension than, than, I, than I see in a lot of shots. On the picture, I was wondering how did you manage this, the setting between shutter speed and aperture because the, the, the horse is completely sharp from the, the face or the, the head of the horse down to, to the tail, but then after you're completely uh, in, in the blur of the depths of field uh, in, in the sand and so on. So it looks like it was perfectly calculated. How, how did you do? How did you do to achieve that? Thank you. I mean, the, the ideal shutter speed is always as fast as possible when you're capturing a moment like that. There, there are slow exposure moments as well. I tend to gravitate around F5, just in terms of giving me enough depth of field to get the horse sharp and just enough um, uh, shallowness around that. So, so that, that's kind of my go-to F-stop for, for wild horses. Completely different if I'm doing portraiture, completely different if I'm doing landscape. So it's just what I've settled on. Uh, around the wild horses and then from there I'm adjusting ISO and shutter speed just to get as fast as possible without without creating too much noise so comfort level for me anything above 800 ISO and I'm getting a little bit nervous so, so I'll, I'll adjust the shutter speed accordingly. I mean it's such a energetic raw image I mean you can feel the energy from it I mean it's not as a subject matter it's not normally something I would go with um, but I love it I absolutely uh, love the image and I'm so so delighted it's one I was looking at your website and there's a lot more obviously of the stallions in color as well and, and and I just wonder why you chose that particular one you know in terms of that raw dynamism do you think the black and white enhanced that more or what was the thinking behind it it's a good question it's one that I've thought about as well is um, Clearly there are images that kind of say wildlife. And I think a lot of my wild horse images will fit in a wildlife category. And that for me is one of the images where people will say, even regardless of whether they're interested in wildlife or wild horses, that image speaks to them. For me, it is, it's why it kind of elevated it and, and, and made it stand above the other wild horse images. So, well, I'd say it absolutely delivered on that. It's a striking, striking image. I mean, you could smell it, you can hear it. Um, it's wonderful and I can't wait to see it in print, I have to say. But in the similar way, I, I also noticed you, you did a square format that you're not usually doing, that I thought was quite interesting. Did you think about it when you did the shot or how, how, how did it go? You know, I was brought up in the rule of thirds and, and even again the image behind me, anger management, they're, they're quite sort of centrally focused. Yeah. And I think square lends itself to that. I have no doubt we're being influenced by the Instagram um, uh, mindset as well of you know what really punches out and, and speaks to you but for me um, there was an element of the, the square shape in this image is, is where the drama is. And uh, Scott can you tell us a little bit about how you felt when you first found out you won? When I got the first phone call I was literally in the middle of a frozen lake in, in Colorado with my camera trained on a, on a deer carcass <clears throat> And I was hoping for eagles to show up. And, and I don't know if the carcass just wasn't ready for the eagles, but nothing was happening. I was getting a little bit frustrated. And then I got this phone call and absolutely blew me away. And of course, ma made my, my whole day. And the, the lack of a shot that was in front of me didn't matter anymore at all. So it was just so uplifting. It was wonderful. Well, very well deserved as well. So congratulations. And thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So that was fantastic to hear Scott talk more about his project and very excitingly we're going to have his images on show this year for the first time in two years coming back to Somerset House in London. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about the exhibition? How is it like? How does it feel to be back at Somerset House? Oh, it just feels so nice after two years to have a real exhibition again. You know, obviously, you know, part of, you know, the whole process of the award and the organisation is to put, you know, is to celebrate the photographers. but. Sitting at the exhibition and seeing people engage with the work, seeing the public come in, 
you know, understanding the work, re you know, reading about it, learning from it, is part of the whole, you know, joy of what, we're, what we do. One of the nice things actually, because we haven't had the exhibition for two years, we've taken the overall the photographer of the year from last year, Craig Easton, and from the year before, Pablo Alberenga, and we're showing a solo exhibition of their work also in Somerset House, because obviously we couldn't give them that real exhibition at the time. So I hope that, um, that, that people enjoy the exhibition as normal, but also enjoy the looking back onto Craig and, and Pablo's work as well. Mike, what, do, what should people expect when they come in to see the exhibition this year? A hell of a lot of images. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's quite a packed show. There's a lot to see, a lot to think about. I've enjoyed curating it. Um, you know, I can't run as many images as I want to because of wall space. I hope people feel it's reasonably balanced, that every room gives them something that they can relate to and come away and think about. So overall, I hope um, people come away feeling really good about it. They've had a good seven, eight, nine, ten hours in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just in one wing. <laughs> Just in one wing. So yeah. I'm, I'm really pleased to have done it again. No, that's great, yeah. We want to exchange talk about photography, about art uh, together, and that, that's really exciting for us, and we, we yeah, we can't wait. Before. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us today and taking part in today's interesting and lively discussion. Just a reminder that all the information you heard here is under embargo until the 12th of April at 6 a.m., and we look forward to seeing you at Somerset House, London, this year. Thank you, and have a good day.